Thank you very much for being so punctual. Um, my name is Luciana Moreira. I'm also part of the Intimate uh, team. I'm here to present you to Professor Sasha Rosnell. She's a professor of interdisciplinary social science and dean of the Faculty of Social and Historical Sciences at University College London. From 2016 to 2018, uh, she was executive dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Essex. And before that, Rosnell worked at Birkbeck, University of London, and at University of Leeds, where she was one of the founding director of the Center for uh, Interdisciplinary Gender Studies. She was also one of the founding editors of the renowned journal Feminist Theory. Rosnell is a sociologist and a group analyst with broad interdisciplinary research interests and collaborations. She, was, she has made major contributions to the study of social movements and gender politics. Her research on intimacy, care and personal life, on citizenship and collective action, on gender and sexuality, and in psychosocial studies has earned a um, global um, reputation. She has coordinated several founded research projects from which we highlight CAVA, Care, Values and the Future of Welfare and Fancied Gendered Citizenship in multi Multicultural Europe, the Impact of Contemporary Women's Movements. It's a great honor to have her here to the, today with us. And thank you, Sasha. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, this talk is called Thinking Through Friendship Queerly. And my starting point is the claim that if we're to understand human experience and social relations in the contemporary Western world, we need to attend seriously to the understudied and unregulated domain of intimate life that we might best call friendship. Can you hear me at the back? Is this getting to the back of the room? Yeah. This universalizing claim is grounded in attention to the lives of those whom I'm going to rather reductively call queers, by which I mean those who, with conscious deliberation and without, by their actions and existence, challenge heteropatriarchal power and its psychosocial formations. It's through a queer lens that I've come to see the profound significance of friendship, to struggles for social change, to community, intimate life and relations of care, as well as to psychic life and personal well-being. This talk will offer an account of the unfolding of my thinking about friendship over time through three bodies of work, which are overlapping but also sequential, and through which run the common entangled and sometimes knotty threads of a queer sensibility and an interest in friendship. This is a bit of a history of my life, I'm afraid. <laughs> Friendship is an increasingly celebrated and commercialised site of sentimental attachment, perhaps as the Valentine's Day markets show signs of saturation. Apparently there is now such a thing as Friendship Day. Uh, it's passed me by, but if you look on the internet, you can find all sorts of products uh, that you can buy to celebrate Friendship. Um, and friendship can be a wonderful thing, well worth celebrating. The wellspring of positive energy, creativity and care, as we heard this morning already. Just as romantic love, sex and other forms of intimate relationality can be wonderfully generative things. But like romantic love and sex, it can also be a relational locus of negativity, destructiveness and exclusion. And its absence and loss can be the source of profound pain and shame. So one of the things I want to do is to draw attention to the complex reality of friendship as a relational phenomenon. Underpinning the thinking about friendship that I'm presenting here is also implicitly a thinking through friendships, through particular friendships with people who've mattered to me and to my work as it took shape and evolved. As again already been said, I felt like quite a lot of my thunder was already stolen this morning. Um, as has already been said, academic work is always a shared endeavour, part of a collective project even when ostensibly we're working as lone scholars and writing alone. We engage with the work of others in our minds through our reading of the literature and listening to, questioning and dialoguing with the ideas of others in collective spaces such as the one we have here. Sometimes that engagement is structured oppositionally through enmity as we enter and engage hostile relations with an author or a body of work. We have to define our work in part through what it is not, what it is against. But the work that grounds this talk has been positively influenced by friendships that are both personal and intellectual, relationships of intimate engagement, respect and attentiveness. Friendships are in essence lateral relationships of mutuality, 
if not always of absolute equality, that elusively valorized and sometimes evanescent quality. And they're anything but fandom or followership, the relations of reverence and obeisance that too often, I think, have structured the shaping of queer scholarship, just as they structure the academy as a whole. The friendships that I've been fortunate to have lived with and through my academic journey have not only been with fellow academics, as again has already been said, and thank goodness for that. Um, this talk isn't the place to try to describe and analyse the role of my non-academic friends in my intellectual formation. I'll, show, I'll spare you that. But it feels vital to acknowledge the many ways, many of which I'm probably unaware, in which my thinking has been shaped by friends from the different parts of my life, as well as those from my academic worlds. A few of my academic friends will be name-checked in the talk because at particular moments they helped move my thinking and research along in consequential ways. But there are also lost friendships with people I no longer count as friends. And again, as has been said earlier, it's quite difficult to tell when, when one loses friends, but you know when they're gone. But who nonetheless have played an important role in my thinking and have left traces of their presence in my mental world. No names, but it's important to acknowledge that friendships like loves can be lost and found, that they always change, and they're never without the tension and conflict that difference the encounter with an, an other produces. This is one of the knots in the thread of engagement with friendship that runs through my work. So there are three parts to this talk, thinking through activism, thinking through care, and thinking through group analysis. I'm gonna start by thinking through activism. And I'm going to take you back to the early 1980s, as Sally somehow imagined I might in her comment earlier about the 1980s, or at least she was conjuring what I was going to talk about. Um, but back to the early 1980s, which is, I know, before many of you here were born, um, to the activism of my youth, and the, body, the focus of my first body of research, which was about the Green and Common Women's Peace Camp and the feminist anti-nuclear movement. Back in the early 1980s, Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Ronald Reagan was in the White House. Gosh, those were, those were good days, I sometimes think. Um, in the 1980s, it didn't seem like that at the time, uh, both the US and the USSR declared nuclear war was thinkable, and it was clear that the Cold War had been reignited. NATO was stationing a new generation of intercontinental nuclear missiles, cruise and Persian missiles, across Western Europe, and the Soviet Union was doing the same in the East. There was a real and present danger of nuclear war, and the doomsday clock showed three minutes to midnight. Across Europe, the peace movement began to stir, reactivating people who'd mobilised against nuclear weapons in the late 1950s and early 60s during the first phase of the Cold War, but also drawing hundreds of thousands of people into protest for the first time. Uh, one of my interviewees, uh, remembered this moment. She said, I remember when Reagan was elected. I was still at university. We had an end of the world party, because that was how we felt. I mean, everybody just got roaring drunk for two days, because we really felt like that was it, that none of us were going to live to see the end of our 20s. There was a terrible sense of helplessness. It felt as if the world was being run by maniacs. There was Russia, and you didn't know what was going on there. And America was being run by this cowboy. It sounds so familiar. Yes. <laughs> and our country was being run by this woman who'd led us into the Falklands War, or Brexit. Um, and if the Falklands had happened, what was going to happen next? So, uh, there were real preparations going on for nuclear war. We were uh, all sent, every household in Britain was sent a leaflet telling us how to take the doors off the, the hinges and build little bomb shelters uh, and that you should get some uh, tins of potatoes in, in case of nuclear war. Against this backdrop, a group of women um, with a handful of men in South Wales organised a walk from Cardiff to the Greenham Common US Air Force Base, which was to be the first site for the next generation of nuclear weapons. They walked for 10 days through South Wales and South West England, arriving at Greenham, where having failed to garner any media coverage, they chained themselves to the fence in a conscious reenactment of the tactic of the suffragettes and refused to leave. Camp was established and indeed lasted for well over a decade. And within weeks, the word was spreading through networks of peace activists and feminists that the Women's Peace Camp needed women to join them. The camp grew in size, spawning new encampments outside each of the entrance, bases, entrance gates to the base, and actions of symbolic and material interruption and intervention proliferated. 
Greenland became the focus for feminist nuclear activism and an inspiration for the peace movement across Europe and beyond, mobilizing over the years many tens of thousands of women who went to the camp for a few hours, a few days, or made their home there for months and sometimes years. Women from all over Britain and beyond, from their mid-teens to their 70s and 80s, left their homes and sometimes their families to go to Greenham. They were from all class backgrounds and many different occupations. Some had been politically active as socialists, anarchists, communists, environmentalists, animal liberationists, liberals, Quakers, trade unionists, students and feminists of every hue. But many were political novices. They arrived as unquestioning heterosexuals, occasional bisexuals, and as confirmed lesbians. And they built a community of protest in which domestic life was lived outdoors, and in which homes were turned inside out, and sometimes families upside down. They built shelters, benders, from plastic sheeting, canvas and string. Meals were cooked on open fires with burnt wood gathered from the common that had to be chopped and stored. New skills and capacities had to, to be learnt. The practical outdoor survival skills that had, during the past hundred years or so, been increasingly gendered masculine. The political skills and courage to speak in public and explain their work at meetings and rallies all over the world. The personal confidence to talk to the media, to represent themselves and claim their voices as actors on the global stage. Personal life was radically deprivatised. Eating, sleeping, even toileting was politicised. That was me having my hair cut. Um, and that's the woman symbol ship pit. Um, <laughs> in the liberal space of this women's community, which was literally right up against the fences of patriarchal militarism, and at the same time constituted a prefigurative, utopian world apart, radically counter-normative ways of being and living were forged. Alongside this everyday living, the act and the activism enacted just by being there, women engaged in repeated, ongoing direct action against the military base. They entered the base, they danced on the missile silos, they blockaded the gates, going in through open gates when police and soldiers weren't looking, and as security was ramped up, fences were cut and climbed, and buildings, guard rooms, the runway were occupied by groups of women who managed to slip past the rolls of razor wire and the armed soldiers. Through the 1980s, during the peak period of protest from 1981 to 1987, which was when the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty was signed that agreed to remove cruise missiles, and we have to note that was actually what Greenland was set up to achieve. It, it did actually result in what it wanted. During this period, thousands of women were arrested, many of them repeatedly, and hundreds of women were sent to prison. And the camp was evicted. Initially from the land owned by the Ministry of Defence and the Ministry of Transport, but with a change in the law that made it illegal to camp anywhere on the common land outside the base, bailiffs were employed and the women were repeatedly evicted several times a day, seven days a week, as a cat and mouse game was played with the bailiffs and the police. So the police would come, the bailiffs would come, there would be an eviction, and then the women would move right back again. So Greenham fundamentally queered the norms of political protest, testing the tolerance of the liberal democratic state that allows dissent as long as at the end of the day, protesters pack up their banners and head home, back to their families and the proper project of reproducing the status quo. The Greenham women wouldn't just give up, they wouldn't go home, back to their families, as the tabloid press and politicians so regularly instructed them to do. Greenham instead made a queer feminist home, a home of women choosing to live and act without men, unprotected and unfortified by husbands and fathers. It was a home open to the elements, to the gaze and security of the world's media, and to vigilante violence from groups of men, both soldiers and policemen sanctioned by the state, and those acting less legally, who attack women in their tents and benders and around the campfires with bricks and stones and red hot pokers and verbal abuse. How was all this possible? How was it that tens of thousands of women came to take part in such actions, leaving their homes, the everyday comforts of their lives, their families and communities, to face down the American military and the British state, to live in the mud with the nuclear base on one side and roads with passing cars of vigilantes who threw rocks and shit and verbal abuse as they drove by on the other side? 
to break the law, to go to prison. Well, it was in part the enormity of the threat, the feeling that the world was on the eve of destruction, as the words of Helen Mary Jones that I started with expressed. Concern about nuclear militarism and its escalation was a fundamental motivating factor. But Greenham exercised a powerful pull to involvement for women as a movement and community of women, living and protesting together without men. It was the power of friendship between the women who constituted Greenham, the bonds of care and affection, and often the romantic love and sex forged at Greenham, that became the life-sustaining force that women were choosing over the relationships and lives from which they came. This was more than solidarity or comradeship, the favoured terms on the left at the time to describe the effective aspects of mobilisation. Sisterhood was the term that had been used in the women's liberation movement of the 1970s and is perhaps closer, but remaining within a familial imaginary, it doesn't capture the chosen and pleasurable nature of the bonds that drew women together at Greenham. Women at Greenham made active attempts to reach out and mobilise other women to come to Greenham to take part in actions. Long before social media, they relied on the distribution of Roneo. Does anyone know what a Roneo is? A very old-fashioned bit. In fact, they might have some in this, in this museum. Um, but it's a very old-fashioned bit of uh, reproductive uh, material uh, where you put your paper in and, and wind a, a handle and out come multiple copies. Uh, as well as photocopiers, which were quite modern in those days. Uh, they would photocopy letters, newsletters and leaflets and send them to mailing lists of supporters uh, in the post, asking every recipient to make and send copies to ten friends. Thousands of women were reached in this way. But in fact, the majority of the women I interviewed in my research hadn't been drawn to Greenham through such conscious mobilisation efforts. Their involvement was activated directly and personally by the enthusiasm of, fr of a friend whose encouragement for them to come along on a trip to the camp or to a local meeting brought them in. Friends who were already involved with Greenham made taking the big step of travelling to a rather remote nuclear missile base seem more possible. Back in the early 80s, very few women had independent access to cars, and many of the women who went to Greenham had rarely ever travelled far from home by themselves. Friends made Greenham accessible. They made arriving at Greenham less terrifying. They explained how to get there, what it would be like when you arrived, what clothes to wear, what to take with you what you might actually do all day while you were there, how and what you might get to eat, where you would go to the toilet, how you could wash, and much more. Greenham was a queer place, and friends who were already involved with it linked it to the places from which women came. But more than that, pleasure in the company of the other women at Greenham became a vital part of being there and a reason for continued involvement. Barbara Rosen, who went to Greenham calling herself a granny for peace, said, I think more reasons for being there emerged. I think the main reason to protest about cruise, cruise missiles being there was always there. But I think the other reasons just happened. It was about being very fond of and being very close to women. I found out what it was like to be really close to women and to be really friends with women and how good women are together. And that was all new to me. Leah said, I'd never really had friendships with women on their own. When you're married, you have friendships with another couple. When we first formed the group in Derby, it just opened my eyes. I'd never seen anything like it. It was amazing. It was the way that women could be together and be friends and talk about things and do things together. It was something I hadn't encountered. i had been brought up to think that anything you did with women was really secondary. Your marriage was the thing and your husband and the things you did with your husband. If you went and had coffee with another woman, that was just a bit of frivolity. It wasn't your real life. Katrina. 31, said, so many women said to me, it's so nice living with women. I never thought it would be. And it was clear they had these concepts, that obviously patriarchy fosters, that women together are just a disaster, that they squabble and fight and they can't get anything done. Ginny, 20. The women weren't the only reason I was there, but they were certainly a big attraction. For the first time in my life, I felt I'd found a place where I fitted in and whatever I was was okay and the same as the others. There were times when I thought I should leave because I was only there for selfish reasons and everyone else seemed to be there for quite high ideals. <laughs> and I thought, I'm conning everybody. I'm conning visitors who think I'm wonderful and actually I'm having an affair. <laughs> we touched each other all the time. You couldn't go anywhere without kissing everyone. It would have been rude. That Greenham thing gets me into trouble a bit now because it's the difference between flirting or being sexual 
just being lesbians with each other. I do miss that. <laughs> Sarah, 17. I remember being really shocked when Jane Dennett said that quite a large percentage of the women there were lesbians. That hadn't twigged at all. I'd had a two-year relationship with a girl at school, but I was so closeted. I was completely closeted to myself as much as to anyone else. Just hadn't made the connection at all. And it was obviously one of the reasons I was being so strongly attracted to Greenham, because the place is heaving with dykes. Penny, 22. I've made friends who are the most important people in my life, and I know that it will carry on being like that forever and ever. I've had lots of friends in my life, but I've never really held on to any of them. I haven't had that quality of friendship with anyone else. They're quite intense friendships. And it was fun. My reasons for going there, that going, that I thought I ought to go, because I felt that people were doing something that I ought to be doing, and I shouldn't be leaving this to other women to do. I kept thinking, I must go. But all when I was there, it was really different, because I really loved it. I loved all the excitement, and I loved to do all the actions and all that. It was great. Mixing with a big group of women, which I'd not done before. I really had a good time and liked it and enjoyed it and that's why I stayed. I stayed because I liked it and I felt that it was important as well. My mate Trina says everyone gets this amount of excitement in their life and we had all of ours in that year, in one year. Rowan, 24. It was all your childhood fantasies, playing cowboys and Indians, goodies and baddies, making a little home out of branches and building a fire and cooking a little supper. It was every tomboy's dream. On top of which, we were all being, out, we were being outlaws, running around in the bushes in the dark with bolt cutters down your trousers, ducking and diving. And Penny, 31. There was something very magical about it. It just seemed to have that extraordinary energy there. If I'm honest, it wasn't just about the politics, it was about the women's energy. Now, I rejected notions of solidarity, comradeship, and even sisterhood earlier. But perhaps even friendship is too narrow and domesticated a concept to capture all this, the effervescence of these experiences. Friendship tends to conjure a dyadic relationship, which is clearly differentiated from a sexual relationship. Yet what we saw at Greenham was, the power, was both the power of friendship between women, which has long been culturally devalued, particularly since the post-Second World War emergence of companion heterosexuality, as the idealised model of white middle class intimate life. We also saw a queering of friendship as the excitement, desire, pleasure and fun in the company, bodies and affection of other women was explored. The powerful affective bonds that developed between the women at Greenham were group relations, although many women also formed dyadic friendships and couple relationships within these wider circles of affective erotic energy and creativity. But I think the queerness of Greenham in a large part resides in the non-dyadic, beyond the couple, group nature of the affective relationships that constituted Greenham, as well as in the transgressions they involved of contemporary boundaries between friendship and sexual intimacy, and the enticement and opening up of same-sex sexual and love experiences for women who'd never before considered the possibility. Now I'm not going to go in today to any detail about the other side of that, the challenges and tensions, the differences, arguments and disagreements that also characterise the group relations of Greenland. Because if we are to understand social movements, we, we have to pay serious attention to the agonism and the conflict that's inherent in seeking to destabilise and transform existing social relations, and indeed to the fact that conflict is inherent in any group formation. But what I hope I've shown here is something of how thinking through activism the activism of the 1980s identifies the role that friendship and affective group relations more widely play as the enabler and catalyzer, the bedrock even, of struggles for social and political change. Okay, I'm going to now think through care. And I'm going to leap through time uh, to the turn of the century, which also now still seems a very long time ago, uh, when with a group of colleagues, some of whom were friends, uh, some of whom still are friends, I should say, in case anyone gets the wrong impression about that, um, <laughs> at the University of Leeds, where I began a new stream of research, um, some of which for me is still ongoing, in which we were collectively investigating changing practices of parenting and partnering in order to understand care, values, and the future of welfare. 
Um, this research group based at Leeds comprised of a number of different projects on aspects of change in family and intimate life. One of which was my project on the practices of care of people who were not living with a sexual partner. So this was looking at both single people and those in uh, living apart or non-cohabiting relationships. I had around this time uncovered a statistic uh, that profoundly excited me and that I still find uh, quite exciting. Um, hasn't changed that much, uh, the, the number's gone down a little bit. But I hadn't seen at that point anyone else working with this in sociology. And the statistic was that 23% of households in the UK in the year 2000 were comprised of a heterosexual married couple and dependent children. I kept revisiting this because it was rather baffling to me that it should be such a small proportion of households. I was really intrigued by the gap between this reality, the minority status of the normative family household, and the overwhelming focus of welfare policy and indeed social science on this model of intimate life. Now at this point, there had been very little research on friendship in sociology. There had been a book by Pat O'Connor on friendships between women. And there was a small body of work in lesbian and gay studies, including Kath Weston's work on families of choice, and writing by gay men, including Foucault, uh, Peter Nardi, John Preston and Michael Lowenthal, much of which was talking about gay men's friendship as a response to HIV and AIDS. Um, particularly the kind of poignant uh, piece that I read and that was quite inspirational for me in, in carving out the Carver research uh, was this quotation, this extract from Preston, Preston with Lowenthal's book. It's finally come into our vocabulary that Tom is my significant other. After eight years, we finally acknowledged what to others has probably been self-apparent all along. Tom cares for me virtually every day. When he cannot be with me himself, he arranges for others to help. He buys my groceries and keeps his Tupperware lunches in my refrigerator. He knows which underwear I want to put on on any given morning, which drawer he'll find it in. Tom's significance is more than logistical. He's my medical and legal power of attorney, for who, if and when it comes time, will decide what measures should be taken to let me live or die. He will plan my funeral. He's the sole beneficiary of my will. Although he spent many nights in my apartment, we've never had sex. But to call us merely best friends denies the depth of who we are to each other. Now, I decided not to do a study that was exclusively about lesbians and gay men, uh, that would decide in advance uh, who they were uh, and that their lives were different from those who didn't identify in this way. So, seeking rather to develop a queer approach, I wanted to explore experiences of people living in a range of different ways, both self-consciously chosen and not, outside conventional, co-resident, domestic, coupled heterosexuality. I wanted to understand their intimate lives, their values and practices, and how they received care. And underpinning this, I was really carrying forward an interest in friendship and its queer potentiality from my work at Greenham, although at that point it was kind of too close for me to quite see the continuities. I wanted to understand the role of friendship in contemporary intimate life. So I set about designing a project and we did some pilot interviews. But as I analysed the pilot interviews, which had involved semi-structured interview questions, of direct questions about practices and values of care and intimate life, I was becoming increasingly uncomfortable. On the one hand, it was really interesting and indeed affirming of my research interests that the interviewees were talking about the importance of friendship in their lives and about how great their friendships were, how much they mattered to them. But it did start to sound a bit like the theme tune to a, a TV show that was very popular at the time. They'll be there for you when the rain starts to fall. They'll be there for you like I've been there before. They'll be there for you. I was hearing this theme tune in the discourse of uh, my interviewees. Now that is an interesting and important finding, actually. It's a new discourse that was newly available to people, I thought. But it also didn't quite seem to be capturing the complexity of what I knew from personal experience was the reality of friendship. I had a strong sense that something was missing, that we weren't capturing the conflicts, the turmoil about friendship, and also about more widely living outside conventional partnerships. I was discussing this with colleagues and friends in the Carver Research Group, uh, my sense that there was more to people's experience than was being revealed in these interviews. 
And Wendy Holway, who was a member of the research group, suggested that I read the manuscript of her soon-to-be-published book, Doing Qualitative Research Differently, in which she and Tony Jefferson addressed what they called the transparent self problem. The assumption underpinning most social scientific research that people are willing and able to tell the interviewer how it is, that they know and are able to capture in words the complexity of their experience. Their book made the case for a psychoanalytically informed psychosocial interview method, the free association narrative interview method, uh, based on the psychoanalytic insight that says that subjectivity is inherently conflicted and that challenges the idea that our interviewees are rational, unitary subjects and that their accounts are transparent. The Fanny method, as I think it's rather beautifully called, the free association narrative interview method, um, as they propose it, draws on psychoanalytic practice in its concern to explore both that which we can expressly formulate in discourse, uh, so the kind of friends discourse, but also the non-rational, unarticulated, unconscious dimensions of experience, the psychic reality, if you like, uh, which interviewees find much harder to access. The method also works with a principle of gestalt, of emphasising the importance of attending to the whole of the data, to the whole of the interview, and not to just chopping it up into themes, as sociological research tends to do. So it, it focuses on the consciously articulated descriptions that people give, the justifications, the explanations that they give of their actions and their relationships takes those very seriously, but it also looks at the emotionality embedded in what's said, the speed, the density, the clarity of the speech, the ordering of stories, what is said when, where stories begin and end, in order to try and look at what's not said, the gaps, the silences, the elisions, the contradictions, the avoidances, the use of understatement, of irony, of metaphor, of asides, of digressions, the free associations in psychoanalytic terms made by the interviewee in response to the question. So I redesigned the project using this method, using open-ended narrative-inducing questions, and found that they elicited much richer material than the pilot interviews have done. We also um, used a relationship mapping exercise uh, where we got people to map their relationships in terms of who matters to them. Um, and we did a conventional cross-sectional analysis of the interviewees, as sociologists normally would do, looking for themes and patterns in the data. So the overarching kind of project did these three different types of data analysis. Well, what did we find? Well, the relationship map and the cross-sectional analysis um, suggested, well, I think it's some really quite significant uh, ideas about the possible direction of change uh, in the early 2000s uh, in terms of intimate life outside uh, conventional couples and families. What we found was, first of all, that there was a prioritising of friendship amongst our interviewees as a source of emotional meaning, intimacy and care. Across a range of lifestyles and sexualities, we found that friendship occupied a central place in the personal lives of our interviewees. There was a high degree of reliance on friends as opposed to biological kin and sexual partners, particularly for the provision of care and support in everyday life, to the extent that it could be said that friendship operated as an ethical practice for many interviewees. And domestic space was often opened up or shared with friends, as we've heard talked about earlier. Secondly, there was a decentering of the sexual couple relationship. Our interviewees talked about choosing to emphasise friends over lovers at this particular point in their lives, often in the wake of painful separations and divorces. And some also acknowledged there had been a considerable de degree of fluidity and movement between the categories of friend and lover in their lives. And thirdly, there was experimentation beyond conjugality, with interviewees choosing to live apart from, rather than to cohabit with a partner, making homes and long-term domestic and care commitments with friends, rejecting the heteronormative progress narrative that suggests that a relationship should be moving towards, a sexual relationship should be moving towards cohabitation, if not perhaps marriage. Um, and friends became, sorry, sexual love relationships became seen as non-exclusive, as uh, sometimes sexually non-exclusive, but more often uh, non-exclusive intimate spaces because of the importance that was being attached to friendship. 
So to sum up, we found that care support, caring support were flowing between individuals who had no biological ties and no legal or socially recognised ties to each other. Domestic space was being reconfigured and its association with a sexual couple in the nuclear family was being challenged. And counter-heteronormative cultures of intimacy and care were being brought into being as lifestyles which had once been a politicised strategy pursued by those within alternative and feminist communities were extending to those who didn't think of themselves as activists or radicals. And our interviewees were not uh, self-proclaimed activists or radicals at all. But what else? Those are the, the cross-sectional findings. I've already done that one. Um, the psychosocial analysis of the case studies opened up uh, further complexity within this. Um, we started to see, I started to see in the psychosocial analysis uh, of the individual case studies that people were also often circling around and struggling to articulate, often intensely individualising experiences of emotional distress, inner and interpersonal conflict, sometimes depression and mental illness, in which they were often ambivalent about intimacy, ambivalent about being close to lovers, and ambivalent about being close to friends. Tension between autonomy and relationality was being played out. Um, and these were important themes that the cross-sectional analysis didn't pick up. So to take one, one case to illustrate this, um, Angel was a man in midlife whose explicit, self-consciously articulated discourse in the interview offered him up as the perfect example of the findings from the cross-sectional analysis. But when his interview is subjected to a more microscopic psychosocial analysis, we see in his words some of the complexity that lies beneath an ostensibly positive story about the joys and pleasures of a life centred around friends and decentering sexual relationships. In common with many of those interviewed, he described his personal life as centering around his friends. Right at the start of the interview, when asked about the people to whom he was closest, he spoke about his friends in the city in which he was living and in London where he'd lived previously. No mention was made of his current sexual partner in this initial response, and it was friends rather than family who occupied his day-to-day -day personal life. He described himself as never having gotten on well with his mother, but his brother, whom he does like, was described as more like a mate than a brother. On his relationship map, he named 31 friends. Now, that was one of the highest numbers of friends named by any interviewee. Um, but he went on to make clear that he particularly valued his local friends. And he spoke about what he called his major socialisation circle in the city he was living in, with whom he hung out a lot, and with a few of whom he had plans to set up a business. He thought of himself as a sociable person who gets on well with people, and the public sociality of the city clearly gave him great pleasure. He painted a vivid picture of an active social life, populated with many friends uh, who he had at the gym, in the bars and clubs downtown, where he'd always get free drinks. And his mobile phone rang several times during the interview, and he received several text messages, um, which all attested to, to his popularity um, and the, the number of people who wanted to get in touch with him. So that was all kind of hanging together in terms of this story. Uh, this is very early on in the interview. He says, several times a week, I just walk up this road, or be going into Northern City, or look over there and go, isn't Northern City fantastic? I really like it because of the socialisation, the fact I can go places. And if you don't like somewhere, you walk around the corner to somewhere else. You can get there easy. You can get home easy. In this quotation, what he likes about Northern City is the ease of mobility, the possibility of transitoriness. Now, on one level, and he goes on to explain this, this is a straightforward comparison with living in London, but for anyone who's lived there knows that you spend an awful lot of time making very long commutes. It's not easy to get around. But on another level, it can be read as a metaphor for his life, for the postmodern personal life described by Zygmunt Bauman in his notion of liquid modernity, in which moving from place to place, from one person to another, is a feature. As such, it's a positive embracing of his current life in the northern city, his friendships and his freedom of movement. But there was another strand to Angel's story, about the importance of friendship, a more ambivalent, submerged story of disappointment, fractured, fracture, thwarted intimacy and loss, and of the psychic distress he encountered when friends failed to offer him any containment. This emerged when he was asked explicitly if he'd ever needed to rely on a friend for help or care. 
this point, he told the story of the end of his relationship with his long-term partner and how he started trying to lean on people and find people to talk to. But he was disappointed, and his disappointments in friendship are tied up with his disappointments in love. He acknowledged that he's had different circles of friends and that he's moved through friendship groups in different phases of his life. The circle of friends he had when he was married went out the window when the marriage went out the window, by and large. Didn't really keep in touch with any of those people. And if lines were drawn, they were drawn because I left. So it was like, sort of, chucked out of that lot. The movement here, in his use of the first person, between not using it, didn't really keep in touch. Using it, I left. And not using it, it was like, sort of, chucked out, is telling. Another illustration of his difficulty of consistently staying with uncomfortable thoughts and feelings and acknowledging what had really happened. He said that he tried to keep in touch with his London friends by phone, but admits he's not very good at this because he wants his friends close by. When his relationship with his wife was ending, in which he presented himself as the injured party, their mutual friends abandoned him too. He said, I did hit this patch where I didn't have anyone to speak to, and I really needed to speak to somebody, and I was aware of that. One couple sided with her and refused to talk to him, and another long-term female friend also took her side. He recounted a number of attempts to talk to friends and expressed a longing for less superficial conversation. One group of friends proved particularly disappointing and provoked a realisation that, quote, men are not really equipped to help in these conversations. Even his best friend, who'd also been left by his girlfriend around the same time, and who therefore should have been able to share experiences with him, wouldn't talk to Angel about his emotional crisis. All of this gives the impression Angel was experiencing what Judith Butler has called heterosexual melancholia, or maybe more precisely, hetero-relational melancholia, in the lingering sense of, his, of lack in his friendships with men, the possibilities of same-sex intimacies not achieved, and the unspeakable sadness of this ungrievable loss. He moved backwards and forwards between a conscious acknowledgement of his disappointment in friends and an ongoing investment in the idea of himself as surrounded by friends who are the most important people in his life. His identity as a sociable man about town was not dislodged by the all too painful shortcomings of his friends' practices of care. Indeed, perhaps these failures served to intensify his investment in the idea of friendship as central in his life. In seeking to defend himself, his fragile self, against the acknowledgement of loss and disappointment, a discourse of friendship and sociability came to matter all the more to him. Thinking through group analysis. Now with this very potted example of a psychosocial case study from my research on care, I segue into the third and final part of the talk, in which I'm going to offer some thoughts about friendship, also from a psychosocial <coughs> perspective, but here not grounded in my work as a researcher, but rather in my practice as a psychoanalytic psychotherapist, and more particularly as a group analyst. The moment I referred to earlier when Wendy Holway handed me her manuscript for doing qualitative research differently was truly momentous, and not just for my research. <laughs> Wendy was the friend who set me off on a course that would lead me to embark on a training in group analysis. And that's a long story, and not for today. Um, but suffice to say that for the past decade, I've been running analytic groups and seeing individual psychotherapy patients first during my training in the NHS, the National Health Service, and since qualifying, running a small private practice. I'd hazard a guess that not many of you know much, if anything, about group analysis. Would I be right? Is there anyone who knows anything about group analysis? A few. Excellent. Lovely. All right. Um, sadly, although group analysis is practiced all over the world and does actually have a strong presence in Portugal, um, the uh, Global Group Analytic Conference was here just a few years ago, uh, and there were 5,000 group analysts in Lisbon for, for a week. Um, so Portugal has a strong tradition, but actually it's a bit of a hidden secret. Um, the group analysis doesn't have the cultural cachet of classical psychoanalysis. Um, it's not constantly referred to by literary critics and film critics and um, chattering classes. And it doesn't have the claims to quick cure um, that have seen cognitive behavioural therapy emerge as the preferred therapy in many healthcare systems. Uh, group analysis has its roots in the experimental therapeutic communities that were developed uh, during the Second World War in military psychiatric hospitals uh, by psychoanalysts beyond Rickman and Fuchs to treat traumatised soldiers in England. 
And it built on the idea that was developed in those therapeutic communities, the radical idea that processing and recovering from trauma can be best achieved in a group setting. The Group Analytic Society was founded not long after the war, but in 1952, by a German refugee psychoanalyst uh, Siegfried Fuchs, Michael Fuchs, along with the sociologist Norbert Elias. And this is where you start to see my, why, why I was drawn to group analysis. Um, to develop the theory and practice of group analysis as a bringing together of psychoanalysis and a Frankfurt School inspired tradition in sociology. Fuchs's starting point, um, which was pretty unique amongst his psychoanalytic contemporaries, was that human living has always been in groups and that the group is more fundamental than the individual. As early as 1948, he was saying, each individual, itself an artificial though plausible abstraction, is basically and centrally determined, inevitably, by the world in which he lives, by the community, the group of which he forms part. The old juxtaposition of an inside and outside world, constitution and environment, individual and society, fantasy and reality, body and mind, and so on, are untenable. As a sociologist, that perhaps doesn't seem so radical, but he wasn't a sociologist, he was a psychoanalyst, and this was a very radical thing for a psychoanalyst to be saying. It's basically saying the individual is always social, is fundamentally permeated by the social. The individual is not only dependent, he said, on material conditions, for instance, economic, climactic, it's also very ahead of his time in recognising the importance of climate, uh, of his surrounding world, and on the community, the group in which he lives, whose claims are transmitted to him through parents or parental figures, but is literally permeated by them. He is part of a social network, a little nodal point, as it were, in this network, and can only artificially be considered in isolation, like a fish out of water. <coughs> and there I think what he's conjuring is that if you take a fish out of water, it dies. Fuchs historicised our understanding of the individual, pointing out that the Renaissance in a society that stresses individual property and competition, that since the Renaissance, as in a society that stresses individual property and competition, a configuration has arisen that has brought about the idea of the individual existing in isolation. So the individual confronts the idea of the community and the world around him as if they were outside of him. Uh, we know he didn't manage to get outside the always using the male gender, but anyway. He relates the emphasis on individual property and competition to the experience that individuals have of the community as existing outside of the cell. We feel like there is us and there is a community outside us. Um, and at the same time being a mere particle of social groups and masses. So, so and also the kind of anonymous experience of being part of a large city, a, a place where we don't matter. So that he or she is left without any true companionship in regard to his inner mental life. The relative isolation and alienation of the individual is thus a very real problem of our time. So he was saying this in, in the late 40s, but there's just a big uh, piece of news media attention in, in England uh, yesterday and the day before to a big new study of loneliness. It's being discovered that loneliness is a major social problem. Well, it, it's not a new one. Um, so Fuchs, anyway, was arguing that what we need is treatment in the group. Group analysis says, Group analysis, he said, simply brings back the problems to where they belong. The community is represented in the treatment room. The two fundamental assumptions of group analysis are, firstly, that belonging, being a respected, effective member of the group, being accepted, being able to share and to participate, belongs to the basic, constructive experiences of human life. And secondly, that resistances in the group's interactions reflect unconscious defences in the individuals in the group. So the group works through processes of progressive communication from the primary symbolic level of commun communication into unconscious communication. And it does this work by group association. So group members are encouraged to just talk about whatever comes to their mind, to free associate. This takes time, people are res resistant to it, they want an agenda, they want to know what they're supposed to be talking about each week, but gradually over time they start to do it. And increasingly they start to bring dreams, uh, and to work with symbols. At the heart of group analysis is a focus on the total interactional field in the group rather than on in each individual. Um, this is what in group analysis is called the matrix. The matrix is the network of all individual mental processes, the psychological medium in which they meet, communicate and interact. These processes are not merely interpersonal but transpersonal. 
So that's not my drawing of a group. That's not my group. But I'm going to uh, go on and tell you a little bit now about what that actually say for us here in terms of friendship. Well, Fuchs observed that groups react and work as a whole, not just the sum of their parts. Transference reactions in groups are different from in individual situations, and groups exhibit collective resistance. The conductor, and uh, Fuchs uses the notion of the conductor to, to refer to the group analyst, because the conductor is, is um, guiding the group, um, but not uh, leading the group. Uh, the conductor works to bring into consciousness that which has been repressed. Uh, with the aim that the individual is freer and more capable of thinking for himself and standing on his own feet. So the classic group analytic group is a group of about eight people, uh, as mixed as it can be in respect of age, social background, educational background, uh, meeting once or twice a week for an hour and a half. Uh, everyone is expected to turn up every week. Um, and it operates generally as a slow open group, so people join uh, obviously it starts at one point, everyone has to be there at the beginning, but when, when someone leaves, someone else joins. So the group doesn't close with everyone leaving at the same time. Someone leaves and someone new comes in. People sit in a circle, uh, there's no set seat for anyone, and where people sit is often a, a, some kind of unconscious communication. So, what have I learnt from practicing as a group analyst, but not just practicing, also being a patient in group analysis, because that's a big part of the training, about friendship. Well, it should be noted that in both the psychoanalytic and the group analytic literatures, there is almost nothing written about friendship. Um, I've done my best to try and find it. Intergenerational relationships attract the vast majority of attention, um, parent-child relationships, followed by sexual love relationships. More recently, there's a small literature on sibling relationships, but almost total silence on friendship. And this is baffling to me because my group analytic practice has always been full of both explicit discussion of friendship and it's also been rich with implications for the analysis of friendship. Sitting in a group with up to eight other people, including the group analysts, brings into play concerns with peer relationships. These concerns emerge in a number of different ways. First and most obviously, group members use the group as a place to talk explicitly about their friendships. They come to the group wanting to talk about something that's happened to them that week since the last group with their friends. And this doesn't happen very often at all in individual therapy. The group setting implicitly opens up and encourages attention to lateral relationships, granting them effective significance. Indeed, the social the group comes first in group analysis. It predates any individual joining. It continues after they've left. Whereas the analyst and lisand therapist patient relationship the dyadic therapy relationship, conjures and reproduces primary attention to the mother-child relationship or the sexual couple relationship. And in, in individual therapy, those are the relationships that tend to get focused on because they're, they're brought into mind by sitting there with one other person. Group analysis validates friendship and other peer relationships as fundamentally meaningful and foundational practices of intimate and social life. It doesn't structurally regard friendship as secondary or compensatory to the sexual couple relationship, or a sublimatory of repressed sexual desire, which is often how psychoanalysis can tend to see it. There is then, gradually over time, increasing attention within the group to the relationships within the group itself, between group members in the here and now. Now, group members are not friends. Group, group analytic groups are always stranger groups. They bring people together who don't know each other. And there is a, one fundamental rule, which is no contact outside the group. So the people are not developing friendships outside the group. But the relationships within the group become quite quickly a focus of attention. So the tensions that emerge between people becomes a focus of attention. The jostling for space to speak. The conflicts and difference of opinion and perspective within the group. There becomes sometimes eventually attention to the envy of someone else's ease of speaking or ease of crying, accessing their emotions, or envy of their success, their lucky break, their seemingly better life, their great relationship, their privilege, their resilience, or their closer relationship to another group member or to the therapist. There's attention to the subtle ways in which we seek to position ourselves as better than others, as superior, as more insightful, more generous, more ethical, more understanding, cleverer, kinder. And also to the ways we unconsciously seek to emulate and draw into ourselves parts of others. 
There's also attention to feelings of being outside, on the edge, excluded, silenced, ignored, misrecognised, overlooked. As such feelings about the relationships within the group emerge, with the conductor, with the analyst's guidance at first, and start to get spoken out loud and discussed and worked through, the relationships change in the group, they develop, and they offer a model for how friendships outside the group might work, and might work through their emotions, um, if it were possible to speak about these things. Conflict, difference, competition, disappointment, envy, and the desire to feel superior are the stuff of group analytic process, just as they are the negative and untalked about stuff of friendship. Thirdly, the group offers the occasion for lateral transference. For, well, I'll explain what I mean by that. For the unconscious bringing into the group of feelings about and aspects of friendships from outside the group. So as well as the explicit discussion of, of friendships outside the group and the discussion of relationships in the group, there's the way in which unconsciously friendships from outside the group come into the group. So as well as what's being talked about in the here and now of the group, the feelings and thoughts a member has in relation to someone else in the group, there is a way in which those feelings about the people in the group can be about relationships that that group member has with someone outside the group. A current relationship uh, or a past relationship, and these can get conjured and then reenacted in the group. So for instance, if someone gets furiously angry with another member of the group, with seeming little reason to the other people in the group, uh, in terms of what they've said or done, it could well be because it's touched a memory of a prior relational experience. If that process can be brought to consciousness by the interpretation of the conductor or indeed by another group member, there's the possibility of working through the legacies of that prior relational experience. While such transferences are often, as in one-to-one -one psychoanalysis, from parent-child relationships, they're also far more often, in group analysis, about other lateral relationships, sibling or tra friendship transferences. In particular, legacies of earlier experiences of peer relationships, at school in particular, come to the surface as exercising a still powerful grip over psychic and intimate life. Acts of bullying, aggression, exclusion and marginalisation in childhood friendship circles haunt adult life and friendships far more than is usually appreciated, affecting our ability to enter into and truly join new social groups, to function in our existing networks and to trust and maintain friendships over time. The group therefore provides a regular and consistent time and space in which members can observe their relationships with peers and observe how others interact with their peers. They can explore their habitual ways of relating to others and experiment with different ways of interacting, talking personally and emotionally about things that they have not spoken about before in a group, or indeed at all, giving and receiving support, encouragement and critique, seeing the world through the eyes of others, developing a deeper understanding of the complexities of the experiences of others. The group is therefore a place where people can develop their capacities for friendship, and I've deepened my understanding of friendship through my practice as a group analyst and through being a patient myself. It sensitised me to just how difficult making friends can be, especially for people who are struggling with anxiety and depression, but not only them. How hard it can be to reach out and make a new connection with another person, to open up to mutual personal exchange. It sensitised me to how hard it can be to speak up in a group, in front of people one knows as well as people one doesn't know, to take up space for oneself, to draw the attention to oneself, to enter the competition for time and space that is an inherent part of social life where time is limited and people are pressing. It's made me think about the realities of the differences that exist between friends and how hard it is to give voice to, let alone work through conflicts and differences in friendships when friendships are predicated on similarity of perspective and shared experience. It's helped me to think about the retreat from conflict and difference in friendship, and from friendship itself into the safety of the similar and the familiar, and indeed often into aloneness. It's made me face the reality of envy and competition between friends, despite, alongside the love, care and concern. And it's made me think about the dynamic processes that operate within groups of friends, the ways that groups exclude as they include, how they can seek unconsciously to enforce conformity and sameness, how subgroups form within friendship circles, often based on pairings of dominant members, 
and her, how social groups can scapegoat the weaker or the more vulnerable, or sometimes even the more socially powerful member, blaming, targeting, emotionally expelling that member from the charm circle in which the rest bask. It might be that people come to my groups because they know something about my interest in friendship and unconventional intimacies. Or it might be that I encourage in some subtle ways the surfacing of issues of friendship. But in reflecting on recent sessions, over the past few weeks, I've been struck by just how much friendship has featured in the group matrix. The group has spoken about socially unrecognised grief for dead friends, about the loss of friends, about the difficulty of making new friends, of staying in touch with old friends, about letting friends see the pain they were living, about the hurt of being forgotten and ignored by friends, of text messages going unanswered. The group has discussed envy of friends and their seemingly picture-perfect Facebook lives. They've talked about growing distance from old friends as members change and stop, for instance, drinking and taking drugs. And there's been discussion of the deep, searing shame of feeling friendless, of being alone, when everyone else seems to be having fun with their friends. So just to conclude, I've ranged over three very different bodies of work in this talk, from the activism of the 1980s, through research on care and changing practices of intimacy, to my work as a group analyst, drawing out some of the lines of thinking that each body of work has provoked for me about friendship. Friendship's been a thread that has run through my work since my time as a PhD student, but I don't consider myself at all a scholar of friendship. Friendship has never been the explicit object of study. But friendship has demanded my attention in seeking to open up the study of social movements to consider queer feminist political practices and the effective relations that underpin and dynamise them, friendship comes into view. In seeking to open up the study of social reproduction, care and intimate life to consider queer practices and needs, friendship comes into view. And in working therapeutically in groups to seek the alleviation and transformation of psychic and relational pain and distress, friendship comes into view. In each of these instances, thinking expansively outside the dyad, beyond the couple, is called for. One of the strongest lessons of my travels around friendship is that we should move or replace the sexual couple with a pair of friends. We need a much more wide-ranging imaginary of friendship, one that's able to conjure, recognise and study the complex relations of affect and affinity, closeness and companionship, and the dynamics of inclusion and exclusion, attraction and repulsion that operate within groups of people we might call friends, in order to grant friendship the significant place in the understanding of contemporary human experience that it should have. In so doing, we might resist friendship's sentimentalisation and simplification. Thank you for listening. <laughs>